Tom, I have a question. The nomenclature is throwing me a little bit where you talk about the uh, individuated unit of consciousness and the free will awareness unit. So this avatar, is this the IUOC in this PMR or is this the free will awareness unit and the IUOC is out past time and space? Yeah, it's the free will awareness unit that is your local consciousness. That's the thing that's making choices for you. It's just a subset of an individuated unit of consciousness. Okay. Now, understand that all of these things, the larger consciousness system, free will awareness units, individuated unit of consciousness, all of those are metaphors. Okay, don't take them too seriously. Don't um, make them into, into, you know, physical things or even real things. They're just metaphors. The way the model was put together is that I had this group of facts that I had gleaned from my research and experiences in consciousness. I had this group of facts from my life and my profession of physics and I wanted to come up with a model that would answer all of those facts from both sides. So I constructed a model so that it would just answer the facts and I had a couple of things that, that uh, were important to me and that is don't add anything in the model that isn't necessary at a fundamental level. Okay. So if it's not necessary to take the next step and to explain the facts, then leave it out. So when I was doing consciousness, obviously there was an information system at the root of the whole thing, so that became the LCS, the source. Then there's us, the pieces, and that was part of the logical process because the monolithic thing needed to break into things because that was how you lower entropy and that's how you know, an information system needs to evolve, so that was a logical process. But now when I had the IUOC, I had two functions. And each one of these things that I give a name is just a function. It's a function of consciousness. So this IUOC really had two functions to do. It had a function that was the accumulator of all the various lifetimes. And I needed, I needed multiple lifetimes because learning is a is a accumulative thing. Learning happens in serial, not in parallel. You have to learn A before you really can learn B, and you have to learn A and B before you can learn C. So to go enroll in A, B, and C all at once doesn't work. You've got to learning is a cumulative step-by-step -step process. So you can't do it all at one time. You need iteration to iterate through the learning. So I had to have multiple lives and then I needed a part of that IUOC to be the accumulator and a part of that IUOC to be the free will awareness unit. So just put a partition. A partition means it's still the same thing. You've just partitioned off some piece of it. So that's the model. Now, you might ask, well, what does that uh, IUOC do all day while the free will awareness unit is out making choices you know, for avatars? And I will tell you that that's pushing the metaphor beyond where it was intended to go. It's not necessary to answer that question in order to model, you know, to have a complete model that goes from consciousness all the way to explaining quantum, quantum mechanics. So it's not necessary to know that piece, what that, that IUOC is doing all day other than it's the accumulator function, you see. So these are metaphors for functions, functions that were necessary, logically necessary, to make a model. And where I don't have to specify what that IUOC does all day, because the model doesn't require any of that, I don't. I don't make up anything to go in there. So the model is a, you call it a minimalist model. It only has in it what is necessary to answer the facts on both sides, the objective side and the subjective side. 
So I tend to avoid questions like what's the IUC doing, you know, all day while the free will awareness unit is at work. Uh, making choices for an avatar because, you know, maybe there's another function there, but if it is, it's an auxiliary function, not one that's necessary to the whole thing. So my model is just, it's just made that way. So it is just a model. It's nothing to believe. It's just a model to use if you find it useful. That's what it is. And really the whole point of my big toe was to make it easier for you to create your big toe. Because your big toe is the thing that makes sense to you. If it's not your experience, it can't be your truth. You have to experience and come up with your own big toe. And that should be your big toe, not mine. You don't have my experience. Believing my big toe is not a good thing. You shouldn't believe anything. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth, and if it's not your truth, just hold it off as a possibility. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, but it's not my truth yet. That's where you should keep it. Neither reject it nor accept it. Just a possibility until it becomes your truth through your own experience. So that's kind of the origin of the model. So I don't answer questions too much about what the IUOC is doing and how that separation, they're just two different functions that that individuated piece of consciousness needs to perform. It needs to connect to the, to the avatar and, and make those choices and it needs to accumulate information. I don't need anything else, you know, to get the model to where I wanted it to go. So I like to keep it simple because where you start elaborating and filling in things because, well, it seems like a good idea. Why not, you know? You start adding stuff that is not, um, you know, I don't know. It, it doesn't have the same level of logical force as stuff that's only there because it's logically necessary to get from one end of the model to the other. So I have, there's, there's issues like that. Well, certainly that IUC is not just sitting there waiting for a lifetime to end up so it can add it to the pile and do its analysis. That wouldn't be much of a job, and I would agree. But there's two separate functions going on there, so I turn it into two separate things. And the reason I make up these metaphors is to give us something to talk about. So every time consciousness, I say, well, here's a function of consciousness. And when I say that, it means that's a function of consciousness that I've determined to be a real function from my own experience of ex exploration and doing research in consciousness. To me, that's one of the consciousness facts. Consciousness does this. It's a function. Okay, so I make up a name for it, like an IUOC or a free will awareness unit, just so we can have a conversation. Because the whole model is so abstract that if you don't break it into functional pieces and give them names, you can't have a conversation. You can't conceptualize it. If I could say, yeah, well, there's a source and it's bigger than anything, but it's not infinite. And it's the source and, well, that's all I got to say about it. And here we are and we're, we're connected somehow. You know, that's just not very satisfying as far as a model goes. So you break it up into logical chunks and those logical pieces so people can follow from the beginning, follow the logic all the way to the end. Now, why do I make the statements I make about quantum physics? Well, it's that same logic chain. Just keep that logic chain going. I can say how the double slit experiments works by looking at the fact that in, a, uh, in our virtual reality, nothing comes into our virtual reality except as a data stream. Our virtual reality is just information coming to individual units of consciousness and being interpreted by them. If information is not sent to a player, then it's not part of the reality. Okay, so in other words, the reality, the virtual reality actually exists as the interpretation of the information in the player's mind. That's where the virtual reality exists. 
It's the player's interpretation of the data they get. There is no place where elves and barbarians run around and fight each other. You know, it doesn't exist. It's only in the minds of the players. The players get it from a data stream. So if it doesn't come to a player, then it can't be part of the reality. Well, that's an answer for the observer effect. Why is it that an observer is necessary in order for you know, the particle to rearrange itself in a diffraction pattern? Why is, you know, why, well, there's no observer, it arranges in a diffraction pattern. If there's an observer, suddenly it does something different. Why is the observer necessary? Because that's a data stream that has to come to some player, an observer. And if that data stream doesn't come to an observer, it can't happen in the reality. So the observer is a fundamental part of the, of how the reality gets rendered. You can't render the reality without sending things to observers. And when you send them to observers, now that's part of the reality. Because the reality exists in the minds of the observers, if you will, or the players. So that's how the same logic that talks about consciousness ends up talking about quantum mechanics. And with that sort of logic, you can see how all the quantum mechanics stuff falls out. So this observer paradox from the virtual reality viewpoint isn't really a paradox. It has to happen that way because the reality only moves forward as observers get information. No observer, it's not part of the reality. It's got to go through the observer to get into the reality. So the observer is an important part of it. So once the observer has information in this case, the which way information and you know, which, part, which slit the particle went through. Once the observer has that information, then that forces it into the physical reality. And with that which way information, it has to act like particles. When there is no observer, there are no particles. There are no particles then what is it going to do? There's only probability at that point. So it's going to arrange itself in a diffraction pattern just because that diffraction pattern solves a, uh, uh, keeps, the, keeps the reality consistent because we know light waves will produce a diffraction pattern. Well, if light is composed of photons, then light as photons needs to produce a diffraction pattern too. But if we send one particle at a time through the slit, we'll still get a diffraction pattern unless we look and determine that there's a particle. Because that then brings the particle into this reality. And once the particle's into this reality, well, it has to act like a particle. Otherwise, there is no particle in this reality. And when there isn't, you get a diffraction pattern because that, that makes a smooth interface between the particle and wave description. Because whether or not you have waves going through two slits or whether or not you have billions of particles streaming through two slits shouldn't make any difference. You're going to end up with the same result. You see, you have to have the same result. It only gets to be a cliffhanger when you only put one particle at a time through those slits but then you have to get the same wave results just to make the reality consistent because otherwise, if you didn't, there'd be an inconsistency in the reality. Well, why not? Whether there's one particle or a million particles shouldn't, isn't gonna make any difference. It's not interaction between particles that's the problem. Photons don't interact like that. You see, so now there's an inconsistency. So the system had to make that single particle do a miracle, which was to rearrange itself into a diffraction pattern just to maintain consistency in the interface between light as a particle and light as a wave. So it's, it's a long way of getting around it, but it's just a model. Don't see it as, as, you know, as it being anything more than that. 
So that's, that's, you know, kind of urge everybody, you know, believing in it, believing that this is the model and it is right, is not a good idea. Stay skeptical of it. Stay skeptical until your own information tells you that it's right. And if your own information tells you that it's wrong, well, investigate that. Say, okay, could I have made a mistake? Or is this the way it is? And what can I do? And if you can't really come to a conclusion, then just keep it all at a, well, maybe, you know? And if you never get any information, well, it's all right. Keep it as a maybe. Just let it be a maybe. Learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. That way you won't trick yourself into thinking that you know more than you do. You know where all your maybes are. Because otherwise what we tend to do is we make up a belief and we take all those maybes and turn them into facts. But really all they are is beliefs. And we feel better because we don't have all this stuff that's unknown. We've turned all the unknowns into knowns by making up a belief and saying, well, they're not un unknown anymore. Those are the facts and here's why. So your belief leads you to think you're a whole lot smarter than you are. If you have all your maybes in there, you realize how limited your knowledge is. And that's a good thing. Who's next? Go for it. <laughs> Hi, Tom. So <clears throat> yeah, I got a two-part question, I guess. Um, this lady over here was talking about fear. And um, I, I realize that my life is run by fear, and I try not to, but it is. And uh, she was talking about fears of uh, snakes and stuff. Oh, lizards. Oh, sorry. Lizards. <laughs> snake with legs. Whatever. Snake with legs. <laughs> lizards. Lizards, I don't, I don't, yeah, it doesn't scare me. But um, I, I guess I have a fear of everything, and I didn't realize it, but um, I've, I'm a musician, and I don't even call myself a musician. I'm playing music for like, 20 years and I've been trying to write a song for 20 years and every time I write one I throw in the trash and I'm like this is not good enough and I go look look at some of my idols you know musicians I'm like damn how do you write that stuff that's damn good why can't I write it and you were talking about you know um the uh uh you just gotta do it and and you know not question it and stuff like that and but every time I try, I'm like, I can't, I can't write this. I can't do it, man. And I also, I'll be at my house playing my guitar. I have like four guitars, and I'll play and I'll just like dill around. But every time I want to do something, you know, I can't do it. And the other, the other question was um, the fear of fear of death. And she was talking about lizards. Well, you can, you can look at a lizard, or pet it, or look at a picture. But I don't really want to like try death. And if I don't like it, not. <laughs> go somewhere you know what i'm saying so how do you get over that fear and that that runs a lot of things i do like i won't go skydiving because i don't want to die i won't go bungee jumping um i won't go in the ocean because i won't get in, being killed by a shark so a lot of things i won't do and but i bet you still get in a car and drive it <laughs> <laughs> every day all day long on a freeway <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't scare me <laughs> but sharks sharks do and so does skydiving so, there you go. Those are my questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, fears usually come in, in groups. Where you find one fear, you'll find a whole lot of fears. Yeah, because fear begets more fear. And that fear begets even more fear. Fears just span out and multiply when you, when you have them. And it sounds like with your, with your writing uh, music or, even, or publishing it, the fear there that's fundamental is the fear of failure. When you have a fear that you're going to put it out and everybody will go, wow, what a piece of trash. <laughs> and when you have that fear that that will happen, then you can't do it. Because if you try to do it, it might turn out badly. And you can't stand for it to turn out badly. Therefore, you don't turn anything out at all. The name of that game is, I can't lose if I don't play. And it's a strategy that lots of people use for all sorts of things. Now, I can't lose if I don't play. So fear of failure, fear of losing, so you just don't play. 
you don't get in there and write it and put it out anyway. So yeah, the courage required there is to say, well, I've written this down. I don't know. I'll stop judging it. Maybe I'll ask other people. Maybe I'll, I'll you know, I'll write it up and I'll, I'll play it for somebody else and ask them what they think. And if they don't go, oh, that was horrible. If they listen to it and they say, oh, yeah, that was pretty nice. And you can say, well, what did you like best about it? And they could tell you. And what did you like least about it? And they might tell you. And get some people to look, you know, to listen and see what they think. And if at least some of the people say they liked it, put it out there. See what happens. Put it out on your, you know, put it on your website. Put it out there and say, here's some of my tunes. If you like them, great. You know, tell your friends. And just slowly work your way into that world and pretty soon you'll have enough confidence to send them off to, you know, people who can put them on albums and, and put them in other collections. So it's a, it's a, that's, the, that's the fear of failure. Or it's sometimes it's called performance anxiety. Where you get anxiety about how well you're going to perform and how well it will be accepted. Other fears, like you know, skydiving and sharks and all the rest of that stuff, and why would you have a fear of sharks and skydiving when the percentage of people, or uh, the probability, let's put it this way, if the, the probability of getting hurt in a car accident is probably many times greater than the probability of splatting in a skydive or the probability of being bitten by a shark. That probability is probably one in a hundred thousand. Your probability of getting maimed in an accident is probably more like one in a thousand or less, one in 500. So there's a big difference there. But you're not afraid to drive. Why? Because you need to drive. You can't not play that game. You have to drive. You can't eat if you don't drive. You can't work if you don't drive. You can't get new strings for your guitar if you don't drive because everything's spread out all over the place. And either you drive or you have somebody else who drives that is going to run your errands all the time. That isn't probably going to work either. So you don't have a choice. You have to play. So where you have to play, you do. And you don't worry about it. Where you don't have to play, where you're not forced, you have anxiety about the outcome, so you don't play. So it's really not about the risk. It's not about how likely you are to get bitten by a shark or to fall out of an airplane without a parachute. It's, it's a sense of, of um, something not working right, failing to get something done, making a dumb decision, like jumping out of an airplane, uh, or, or swimming around with a piece of raw bloody meat, you know, something like that, you know, bad decisions. It's, it's about, you know, what if these things happened? Everybody would say, oh, poor guy, went swimming with raw meat, what a bad idea. <laughs> and you'd be embarrassed if you were still alive, but you don't want that. You know, so it's not just your own fear for your own safety or you wouldn't drive a car. It's an irrational fear of not taking risks, not losing. You know, yeah, everybody else can swim in the ocean and they probably are fine, but if I get in that ocean, I'm likely to get bitten. Yeah, lots of people jump out of airplanes with parachutes and it's very unlikely that none of them are going to splat. But if I jump out of an airplane, 50-50 well, you know, chance, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's the sense. That's the fear of your own, your own, uh, what? Lack of faith in yourself? That's a problem. Not really the fear of the risk. It's a fear of not doing it right. It's a fear of screwing up. It's a fear of being inadequate. That's, that's the fear. Not really a fear of sharks or even a fear of you know, falling out of airplanes. The fear is of being inadequate because you wouldn't fold the chute upright or you wouldn't check to see that you know, the orange cord was at the right place because that's an important check to do. You might mess that up and if you did, 
you know, your chute wouldn't open because you don't trust yourself to be adequate enough to do those things without a problem. So it, you have to get down to the root of that fear. Why do you feel that sense of inadequacy? Where does that come from? Kind of see where did it first start, and you can do that in a meditation state, or you can do it just any time. You don't need to do it in a meditation state. And you'll probably find that there was something in your life, mm -hmm. some place in your life where somebody continuously put you down. <laughs> somebody uh. continuously said, you're worthless. Somebody convinced you that you were inadequate and anything you did would probably fail. Well, it's funny you say that because, um, you know, 10 people could say that, you know, I did something right or that, that was great or this is great. And then one person says, you suck. And I'll believe that person. So right. and you could have like 10 people in a row, but the one person that says, you're right, you're not good at this, that, or the other, I'll believe that person. Right, because that is you're your belief. Yeah. You believe it. We tend, to, we tend to accept what we believe. You believe that you're failed. Mm -hmm. When that one person says it, you go, yeah, I know that. It <laughs> really rings true with me, you know, because that's the way I am. I'm not very good. So that's why you'll believe that one person. Those other 10 are probably much better critics. Even if one, that's what I said, even if you ask 10 people and even two or three of them say that's really good, <laughs> publish it, put it out there. See, everybody doesn't like the same kind of music. There's some people who say that stuff's really awful and other people love it. So you can't just go on a few opinions. So anyway, go find out, you know, why is it you have that and then deal with it. Typically, it's somebody somewhere along the line, typically when you were very young, mm -hmm. typically convinced you that you were inadequate. That's just the way these things tend to run out. And now, all the rest of your life, you see, you're playing that game with that fear, which then informs all your choices. I don't go swimming in the water because the sharks will get me. So it informs the things you do and the way you feel, and I can't put songs out. So here it is affecting your life. And what was it? It wasn't even about you in the first place. When that person that told you you were inadequate, it wasn't about you. It was about them. You see, it was their problem. They were having a problem. They had some sort of negativity problem where they just couldn't be nice or couldn't be giving because maybe they had been traumatized by you know their parent or something else so they had all this anger and angst well up inside and for whatever their reasons were they end up being really negative to you but you see it wasn't about you it wasn't about how confident you were or not it was about them it was their problem and when we have problems we tend to share them particularly with our children and families. So once you realize that, you can let go of it. You can say, well, here this fear is affecting my life, and geez, it didn't, it, you know, it didn't even mean anything. Just some grouchy person that liked putting people down to make himself feel better. That's the typical reason people put other people down. It's because they make themselves feel more important and more valuable. So they put other people down and instead. So once you figure all that out, and that may take you a year, you know, to dig all that up, it doesn't have to happen quickly, but it can happen quickly. But work on that. Find that fear. Find the roots and rip it up with those roots and throw it away. You don't need it. It's not true. It's just an expression of somebody who was cranky for whatever reason they were cranky. Maybe they just didn't like you because you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe you were somehow inconvenient for them, or maybe, who knows what it is. Maybe you were looking successful when they weren't, so they wanted to put you down. Who knows? It's just a long, long list of the possibilities of why some people act very badly toward others. But it's almost never about the others. It's always about them. You see, it's not you at all. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're adequate or inadequate has to do with somebody else venting their negativity to make themselves feel better. So once you get back, once you see that and own it and feel it at the gut level, 
getting it at the intellectual level is nice, but it's not that helpful. You got to get it at a deeper level. And when you do, all those fears will just go away. Poof. And when that one central fear goes away of being inadequate, all the rest of them, the sharks and the airplanes and everything else just disappear at the same time. They all come out of the same root. So that's the way to proceed on that. So two questions, and the first one I hope is quick. Um, I thought you said a few months ago that you were trying to line up a second lab to do the experiments. Is that still happening, or was it so hard to get everything going that it's just No, the one I lab? may have said that, but if I did, this one that uh, is doing it now here in, in Cal Poly, that is the second lab. Oh. I may have said that we had something going on in Montreal for a while. And there was a set of physicists there that said, yeah, we'll, we'll do this. And then they started to drag their feet and drag on and drag on. And then it kind of disappeared and it was clear that they had no intention of doing it. Okay. So maybe at that time, while I was waiting for that to resolve, I was also working this thing with the Cal Poly, which then turned out to work. So that's, that's my only guess. But other than that, no, there isn't any other thing going on in any other place just yet. We're expecting this to happen. The way things normally work is that if these experiments get done and if they turn out positive, that is the way that I think they will, they will turn out, if that's the case, they will be published in a physics journal. Matter of fact, that will be much easier this time because we published an article what, a year, two years ago, something like that, a few years back. And that article turned out, for, this was in the Journal of Foundational Quantum, Foundations. Quantum, Quantum Mechanics Foundations. Caltech, right. right? And that paper has been more sought after and more requested than anything they ever published. It's been the big one. And how does a journal get bona fides? How does a journal get credibility as a journal? How many requests do you get for your articles? So they like us. They will probably you know, be amenable to the next paper that we write. You know, what they don't probably know is that there's very few other of the scientists or physicists who are sending in papers that have 52,000 subscribers. <laughs> right. So. Okay, so my second question has to do with religion. Um, so I, I was raised in a, f a fundamentalist religion, and I'm not asking you to like alienate a bunch of people by bagging on religion, but it, it caused me to go study just comparative religion and just to see what kind of the parallels were. And when I observed a lot of things about that, and then when I read MBT, and kind of got the fear versus love paradigm, I saw that like religions are kind of, they're, they're really a mixed bag of yeah. both. And you've talked very positively about kind of spiritual paradigms that have come uh, through time with religion and they just use different symbols and metaphors and spiritual practice. And so the whole spiritual evolution side of it has always been there. But then there's also this really sort of primal human where you know it's based on fear and it instills fear and it uses fear to control right. and it comes up, up with all kinds of rules and mechanisms for controlling people and if anyone's interested in that I don't know if anyone else has a background like mine but um, Steve uh, there's a guy named Steve Hassan who was Jewish and went into a cult he has a website called freedomofmind.com, and he did cult research after he came out. His family intervened and helped him leave this cult. It was the, the Mooney cult. Mm -hmm. And um, then he just he, he started studying all this and came up with a model called the BITE model, where they it's control mechanisms that uh, cults use to control behavior, information, thought, and emotion. Sure. And um, 
then I saw this in my own religion and um, but also again the mixed bag kind of the good and the bad my question is so religion has been extremely resistant to scientific progress like religion still I think today the nun group is bigger in the rising generation if you ask them what their religious affiliation is so there's there's some kind of trend happening even right now and we don't even have your your experimental results like something is going on right now that is de-religionizing a lot of people and um but over time like even you know evolution newton galileo you name it like science along the way has had to fight against whatever religious doctrine it was coming up against that it conflicted with my question is do you see in the future what what do you see i guess in the future with um i guess maybe the the shift that might happen and and how is there going to be a reaction there like religious fundamentalism is is a weed that's really hard to kill yeah it is yeah there will be some struggling going on there obviously and there'll be a lot of it that'll be one of the corners that we'll have to turn if we're going to get to this kind of gentler place that we're going to and what you're seeing those those things that aren't too useful in religion are things that are mostly centered around fear. They're centered around control. And that starts to grow in any organization as it becomes, in any religious kind of organization, any organization like that that's, that has a lot of membership, that happens as soon as you have an organization. As long as it's just individuals, everything's fine. As soon as you have an organization, then that organization has power as a function of its number of members. It has clout. It even has credibility. It has political power. It has financial power based on its numbers. So pretty soon, even if the organization started with benevolent ideas about peace and love, once it's an organization and once the kind of the original people who were mainly about peace and love are dead and gone, eventually there is a strong tendency for that to grow into we need to get more people. And how do you get more people to do anything? How do you manipulate people? There's only one sure way, and that's through fear. Fear is the tool that manipulates people. If you know what someone is afraid of, you can make them dance to the tune of your choice by manipulating around that fear. Who uses fear to manipulate? Well, religion is one. Do what I say. Give me 10% of your income, or you will go to hell and burn forever. You know, that's just obviously a ploy to fear to manipulate people to do what you want them to do. But religion isn't the only one in that box. Who uses fear to manipulate people? All the advertisers, all the marketing people, okay? all the politicians. You know, almost everyone uses that fear. And it wasn't such a big problem until we had mass communications. Okay, it's propaganda. And propaganda, if it's local, is not such a big problem. It doesn't spread very quickly. But propaganda, when you can reach, you know, 300 million people in an afternoon, starts to become a pretty sizable weapon. So, people construing things to be fearful helps them manipulate, helps them gather people together, helps them cement uh, commitment to their organization. And whether that is a religion or a marketing firm or some um, bunch of people who just have an issue that they want, if they can somehow frame that issue as a threat, you know, something fearful, well, they start attract attracting donations and, and start building up a people. 
If they can't cast it as something frightening, something fearful, nobody seems to care. Part of that is just the way humans are. We react to fear. You know, for that same, you know, people have become focused on the negative because that was better for survival. That's part of our instincts. We focus on the negative. A man and his family went out and they ate a bunch of these yellow berries and they had a really good time and put on a little weight afterwards. Not an interesting story. Nobody really cares. A family and his children went out, they ate these purple berries and they all dropped dead an hour later. That's news you can use. Don't eat those purple berries. You see? That's got survival value in it. The other one didn't. Well, the other one had a little survival value, and that is you can eat those berries. So there's a little survival value in it, but not the same kind of critical survivability you get with something that hurts you. So we tend, if there's something going on and there's something negative going on, you just focus right in on it. You know, some little girl disappears someplace off a beach and wherever, and we'll hear about it for three weeks three or four hours a day, you know, we just hear about it and hear about it and hear about it because it's frightening, it scares people. But something really wonderful happened, you know. Somebody went out and, you know, fed people or helped people, uh, you know, live better. Somebody built a house for somebody else just because they wanted to the help. You might get a little byline on that, but nobody really notices. And it doesn't draw heads, and people don't get fixated on it, and you don't hear the story repeated for three weeks in a row, you know. I mean, if it gets mentioned once on page six, that's about all you get out of that. That's part of just our survival instincts. We pay attention to the negative. Well, people who are fear mongers can use that instinct. So that's, I think, what happens with religions. Mostly they start out with some people who had some big ideas, saw reality in a way that had a lot of fundamental truth in it because most religions do have fundamental truths at their core. It didn't just happen by accident. Somebody, you know, found that and talked to people. The other thing that happens is they miss the idea that if it's not your experience, it can't be your truth. They, they don't have that point. So they have the idea that if I can get you to believe what I believe, now there's two of us believe it, and that's more powerful. You see, so they forget the idea. You're not really helping people by giving them a belief. Matter of fact, you're hurting them. You're, putting, you're, you're making it hard for them to see other things and other possibilities because of that belief. So the idea that the way you spread your idea is to convince a lot of people of it, that doesn't really spread the ideas. That's not helping anybody really grow. That's all intellectual. All that's doing is getting a bigger membership, which collects more money, gives you more political clout. One of the things I noticed about religions is that in some way, the person who maybe had this original idea, they connected with the larger reality, for example, then they come back and they claim they have this message for humanity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they make some sort of divine authority claim where you need to listen to me because I'm going to tell you how to avoid all this fearful stuff. It almost seems like they're a double agent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Well, that's because they probably are double agent in the, in the sense that just because people have seen bigger pictures, you know, Anybody can collect this information. Anybody can, can uh, get up close and personal with the larger consciousness system. Anybody can do this. All they need is a will to do it and enough free time where they're not busy surviving. So there's been, you know, the exploration of inner space only costs free time. So it's been done for millennia. You know, while the exploration of outer space is expensive, you know, that doesn't happen much. Individuals can't do that, but people can explore inner space, and they have. So there's people all through, you know, for like millennia, who have had these bigger pictures. They're correct, but it doesn't mean that they have no fear, that they have no ego, 
that they're all love. You can get a lot of this information and still only be half grown, a third grown, and you can understand it. And if your understanding is mostly intellectual, you kind of put together the picture and it makes sense, well, you're, the growth you get out of it may be pretty minimal. So there's no incompatibility with somebody saying, yeah, I got all this great stuff. And by the way, you need to listen to me because I'm special. And please give me some of your money too. <laughs> you know? And be sure and vote for the person that I want you to vote for. You know? So yeah, that happens. You know? So it doesn't mean what they got wasn't genuine. It just means maybe they weren't that grown up yet. You know, take Buddha, for instance, you know, Buddha, the people around him at the time of his, of his life wanted to create some kind of organization, and Buddha said, no, no, we don't want to go there. Look, I'm just wandering around talking to people, and if you want to follow me, I can't make you stop, but, you know, it's not like we are creating a movement here, but the movement happened anyway. Happened anyway. Krishnamurti was kind of recruited to be the head of various organizations back in the 1850s. They wanted him to be, um, who was it? I don't know, a couple of different groups. Fa huh? Yeah, Theosophist Society got Krishnamurti and said, we want you to be our head, and you were head of this thing. And he said, no way. Because he knew that as soon as you get an organization and you're ahead of it, it's about the organization. It's not about the bigger reality. And that, he was grown up enough that that was perfectly clear to him, and he refused. No way. I'm not interested in becoming or starting or even working in an organization. Yeah, theosophy. So... You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah, religions come up, and yes, you're right. People are fearful. And when they're fearful, they're very anxious to find something to believe that puts their fear at rest. So they jump to beliefs. Yes, you know, you know that, that big rainstorm we had last week, it was so terrible and so destructive. That's because the rain god didn't like us. And the way you get the rain god to like you is to give me money. You know, is to make canoes for, for, you know, for my use, whatever. So these ideas have, all, have been obvious and harnessed all through humanity. So religion has, you know, religion in as much as it is, what, spiritual, is as good as any other spiritual path. Religion in as much as it's dogmatic, Here's what you have to believe. Here's what you need to do. Just do what I say. It's all about doing. It's not about being so much. And that's not useful. But it appeals to lots of people because now they feel more protected. Rain God isn't going to get them anymore because they've been making sacrifices or sending money or corn or doing something to appease it. So it makes them feel better. Again, using fear to manipulate. But religion can be spiritual. It can be not spiritual. Whether it's religious or not, it really isn't the thing that, that makes that divide or that's important. What's important is, you know, is it about love? Is it about caring? Is it about giving? Or is it about manipulation and control and power? Thank you for not starting a religion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before Rick, um, I just want to say that you had told me when I was talking to you about how this all happened to me, and some of you have read the book, understand that I had a traumatic childhood, and then I moved into a drama of my, my life to survive that, and then into the transformation of this. But you said to me, Tom, that my reaching out to God, my praying, my all of that was, as a young child, 
around organized religion was me learning to access the LCS. Sure. Yeah. So that's where a lot of that religious roots, I've, I know that they've been helpful from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, first a statement and then a question. Uh, if anybody hasn't tried VR, put a headset on, I would highly recommend that you do. Uh, because we talk a lot about VR, and you talk a lot about VR, but I don't think anybody, that, that many people have experienced VR. And uh, I, about a year ago, I was trying to develop uh, uh, VR experiences and found that economically it, was, it just wasn't happening. It just wasn't happening, get, trying to get that kind of uh, skill level from people and their interest to not just blow up zombies, to do other things that might be a little kinder. Uh, it just wasn't there. But regardless, uh, uh, to just try it on, even for 10 minutes, is to know that there is this, you can be thrown uh, into a compelling uh, landscape with this really low-grade you know, information coming into your eyes, and only your eyes, that your whole body and everything will react as if it were uh, you know, in, in this kind of reality. Uh, and then you take it off. You know, and then you're someplace else, and it's really clear. I mean, you get a really clear experience that you are in a di- different data stream. You know, it came out of that computer sitting over there in the corner, uh, and it was so compelling, you will be scared. You will think you're going to fall off a building, and then you can fly, you can do all these things, and you'll have that experience that VR is compelling, and this VR that we're in is also compelling. There's other compelling VRs out there. And so for, for 10 bucks, you can go give it a try. <laughs> yeah. Well, right now, and for the past almost two decades now, me talking to people about this being a virtual reality is a very hard sell because people just have a hard time wrapping their head around they are an avatar in a virtual reality. It's like, really? Nah, that doesn't compute. You know, here it is. I feel it. I touch it. It's real. So it's a hard thing for people to get their mind around. A decade from now, be totally opposite picture. A decade from now, the virtual reality and the virtual reality games will have been so pervasive because they've just in their infancy now. And they and they spread and they get better and better and cheaper and cheaper. When you tell, you know, a, a twenty something year old a decade from now that you know this reality is really a virtual reality, they go, Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be this, what? That's crazy. It'll seem a lot more rational then than it does now. And that, that's happening, you know. That's happening today and has been for a while yet. So virtual reality is not always going to be so tough to yeah. sell people. Well, I hope it's not. Gonna yeah. be, that's, that talk will be easier and easier and easier. And I don't mean sell people, I convince them to believe it. I mean, sell people just in the sense of that they that they consider it as a possibility. That possibility is going to be obvious. Yeah, I think it's very clear when you try it that, it's, as I said, the experience is so compelling. You can believe what you're in is a comp- another compelling experience, just better pixel rate. Right. Mm-hmm. Once you have the experience in some other virtual reality and it is as real as this one, or very close then you can understand how yeah. that might be possible here. It makes sense to you then. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. It's part of the reason that I think in the next couple of decades, we could take a sharp turn for the better in becoming a kinder, gentler place. Yeah. Well, as long as that's still always about shooting zombies. In the meantime, so. yeah. <laughs> Our whole attitude toward reality is going to change rather dramatically. And virtual reality is going to be one of the key things that does it. Yeah, it's, and when that worldview changes, there's going to be a whole lot of fallout that changes other things. With that worldview change, will be a, a big, you know, a, a very large sea state change just in the way we think of anything. What's good, what's bad, and why. So we've been chugging along the way we are now for 200,000 years. And I think we're just about to get to the part where the curve gets steeper and the change gets faster and greater and more significant. And I don't think that's that far ahead of us, just a few decades. 
and VR is going to be the, the thing that leads it off, VR concepts, then VR actually when you put the goggles on and get on the platform, and then the fact that scientists, who I call the high priests of Western culture, <laughs> The scientists, when they come in and say, yay, verily, this is a virtual reality, that will kind of start that ball rolling, and it will be hard to bring it back. Yeah. Big changes coming. You know, you think, how does technology change us? Well, think about the, you know, the automobile, the cell phone. I mean, technology changes us immensely. You know, the factory, manufacturing, robotic tools in manufacturing. I mean, all of it has just made huge changes in the way we live. How would, how would you live if you got rid of your car, got rid of your cell phone, you know, got rid of your TV set, got rid of your computer? What would life be like? We probably can't even imagine that, even though we've only had those gadgets for 25 years. You know, we can't imagine what life would be like without them. We don't even remember what it was like without them. It changes us that much, and the internet and the communication technology is bigger than all the rest of them put together. And we have just begun to see the changes that it's going to create in our reality and in our society. So the virtual reality and the internet and a whole bunch of people wanting to uh, find some better way to live is all going to converge, I think, in a, in a big smash up that hopefully out the other side will come kinder, gentler world to live in. And I think it's going to be in a, in a decade or two. Hmm. It's possible. Hope so. Hope I live, live so long. Uh, so then comes my question. Uh, my other big book, you know, that I uh, absorb and kind of making my own MBT out of is uh, this one called How the World is Made. And uh, it's based on a, a geometry, just regular geometry, not woo-woo geometry necessarily. And, uh, but it starts with the, the the usual coincidences in the universe and of the, like the moon and the sun being basically the same size, uh, apparent size from our viewpoint. Um, and certain ratios that exist in nature and that then have been translated into all the uh, monumental architecture, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, pyr the pyramids, the uh, uh, call it Stonehenge can just be laid on top of this, the ratio of the circles, outer circles exactly relates to the moon and earth's ratios, size ratios, at a time when obviously nobody would have known what those were, except that somehow this is a kind of a resonance of something that's true. I mean, something that's in the programming that humans somehow intuitively understand. It's, you know, and, the, and the, uh, their solar system is kind of constructed mm -hmm. in a way to, you know, resonate with that uh, underlying. I mean, I, I'm starting, because of you, starting to think of it as, code or kind of a wink from the coder, you know, that, hey, we, put, we set it up all here for you like this. Yeah, well, what, what's, that, what's underlying that is that every virtual reality has a rule set, okay? A virtual reality is a computed reality. So it's, it's mathematically based, not because of some mystery that why should the world be so mathematical. It's mathematically based because it's being computed. You compute things with mathematics. You make models with mathematics and with computers and with computer processes, you know, like fractals. It's a, it's a, it's a math-based thing. So we should find um, regularity. We should find mathematics. We should find geometric relationships. We should find ratios. We should find all of that because it's computed. And it's computed in the most elegant and most efficient way possible. Which means you're going to see a lot of things repeat. Once you've got something that works, you reuse it. Any good programmer does that. You get code that does something useful, you reuse it in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. So one should expect a mathematically based universe because it's a computed universe. How could it be any other way? I just find it, well, I'm, I'm always surprised that human, people are not amazed that the, just the basic sun and moon uh, size, apparent size from Earth that are, that are identical, isn't 
so bizarre that they don't automatically want to find out, I mean, go deeper you know, the, yeah. the, to that. So. Next, yes. Hi, Tom. I um, following the theme of fear. I, I, my question involves dealing with fear in the dream state. And I, I've, I've shared with you in the past. I was, I had a, uh, I, I was always happy, having dreams and not fearful of them and enjoying my dreams. And and I, I still am. But on the way to the intensive, I, uh, I had a. a fear test in which you know an animal was running after me and I stayed still and you know kind of tried to deal with it and, and somewhat and you told me that you know it didn't pass but it didn't fail either it just laid in there and eventually uh, um, it went away but and just like you said it would happen again you know and it did um, and but you see my my issue is, as opposed to previous questions in the previous example that you gave, you laid out a plan to deal with fear uh, of the the lizard or a phobia in in the physical state. Someone that has a phobia in the physical state, and you laid out a plan to try to deal with that. Is there any? Are there any tips? For example, to dealing with the fear in the dream state, and the reason I ask that, and what frustrates me is that the the my problem in this recurring fear test involves something that I'm passionate about in the physical, in in the in, in the reality. I love dogs. So I don't have a fear nor a phobia whatsoever about that particular issue. I've always loved what's in question. But then I'm in a different state. And for example, in the last one, all I remember is, you know, I was running from one like crazy and I got into a corner and then I woke up totally. So I failed that one pretty good. <laughs> so instead of facing it. But, uh, and I see my question almost like, trying to involve my intellect when I'm in the state in which my being level is is involved, like the dream state. So here I am in the physical state looking into my intuitive side. And over there, I have the situations in like, such as the fear test in which I'm driven my, by my being level, and I'm looking for my intellect to deal with the situation. Because if I could, I, I, I would know how to do, I would, I would confront it, because it's something that I love here, mm. but not there. Yeah. So I'm not sure if, the, if there are tips that you can give me to handle something, especially something that here I'm passionate about, but over there I'm being tested pretty good, and I, don't, I can't compute how I see things here. Yes. Okay, one way to do that, and, and uh, you do just have to have the courage to face it. And one of the ways to develop that is use your intellect on this side, okay, on the physical side. Use your intellect to program your intuitive side. And you do that by having in your mind an intention that next time you are terrified by anything in your dreams, whether it's big dogs or, or two-headed chickens. Whenever you're terrified by anything, you will face it and deal with it. Okay, so now that's an intellectual thought here, but you keep telling yourself that and you keep repeating that. Say, so next time that happens, I'm going to face it. Next time that happens, I'm going to turn around and get down on one knee where I'm non-threatening to, to the beasts and I'm just going to pet them. And if they you know, go for my throat, so be it. I'll accept that. But I'm not going to be afraid of them. So if you tell yourself that 
and you tell yourself that, and you tell yourself that, you can program that attitude into your intuitive level so that when you get there, your intellect isn't working there anymore. Your intellect is you know, still someplace else. It's back here. But that thought, that, that, uh, that directive will be there, and you'll be aware of it, and you can get strength from it because you'll feel it. You'll feel it. It says, okay, this is the test. I'm going to face it. So that's the way you do it. You program. You can use your intellect to program your intuitive side just by repeating over and over again. It's the same thing where people put things up on the refrigerator door that says, I am a good person and this is going to be a great day. You know? And they're supposed to repeat that and say it 10 times every time they see it. I'm a good person and this will be a great day. And the more they repeat that and the more they say it, actually, the better they feel and the better their day is. Because they're programming another part of them to act in such a way and be in such a way that it makes it a great day. They're changing their attitude toward, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. You know, kind of negative thing to, this is going to be a good day. So when that bad thing happens, they'll go, oh well, not a problem. Let's keep going. Whereas if you have that, oh, what's going to happen today, that bad thing happens, you go, oh no, I knew it. I knew it was going to be a bad day. And then you sit around and wallow in self-pity for a few hours and you know, the whole thing goes bad. So just by changing that intuitive self to be programmed for success and what you want to do is very helpful. Repetition is a key to programming the intuitive side. Just keep repeating it and repeating it and going over it. And pretty soon your intuitive side will react on it. So that's about the only tip I can give you for you know, when that happens. But prepare yourself for that. Get ready. And don't just make it big dogs. Because if it's just big dogs, then instead of big dogs, you're going to get big cats. Or you're going to get a you know, big gorilla. You're going to get something else. But it's funny you say that because I had a gorilla too. <laughs> yeah, for real. I, I passed that one though. So I've I've I like that I've had more and more of these since you know the last time that we spoke, mm -hmm. and I feel it, it's interesting how when when you you behave accordingly or positively and you 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 pass the fear test, you even wake up accomplished. I felt that. So some of them were positive, but I, it just kind of drives me crazy a little bit. I put a dog running behind me, and it's kind of like I'm all over the place, and I don't respond as I should, you know. Keep so, working on it. So uh, Keep working on I, it. I passed the gorilla test, yes. <laughs> so thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Good. Good. <laughs> Good. I wanted to ask you about the experiments. If I understand correctly, one of the first experiments is going to be whether or not we still get a diffraction pattern if the detectors are detecting, but the recording data isn't working. Is that going to be one of the first, or has that already been done? No, that's the one we're going to do first. Excellent. That's Excellent. That's number one. For, the, for, for me, that's the easiest way to explain to people that uh, it's not what they think when they're looking at the double experiment double slit experiment um, that was my first question yeah, my second question, question number one is uh, my whole life I've struggled with what was I supposed to believe am I supposed to believe what my relatives were teaching me about Christianity or or you know I, I struggled with that uh, at first, I wanted to believe, and I even saw miracles in my life that made me think, okay, yeah, this is, this is the way it must be. But then when I got into high school and I started uh, studying history and I started seeing church history in particular and seeing how what all these people were doing to each other in the name of God and how they all said, oh, we're right and everybody else is wrong, I, I, just, I came to the conclusion, okay, you're all wrong. And if uh, there is a God, I want it proven to me. And then 
later in my life, I had a, a time where I somebody had given me PCP and put it in my soda pop. They thought it was a great joke, and then when I started coming unraveled because I couldn't under I could not understand what was happening to me. Uh, I wanted to go postal on these guys, but I, you know, I couldn't do anything like that. I couldn't do anything like that. I, I finally, I picked up a Bible and started reading it and, and it seemed like all of that went away. So I thought, then again, I thought, okay, well, this must be the answer again. So I started going to church and all that stuff. But after a while, that just wasn't working for me. And, and then I struggled with that for years and years and years until I discovered MBT. And now it's like, you know, what you read in the Bible, the truth set me free. So my question, and I asked this, t I posed this question to Ted Vollers once, and he gave me an answer I didn't really care for, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you anyway. <laughs> Let's, uh, next time around, is it going to take me 50 years to find MBT? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say probably not. If you grow up this time, Getting back to the same place you were is a lot easier next time. That's the whole point. Every time you reincarnate, you start from where you left off. This is a cumulative thing. So if you figure things out in a major way, anywhere along this, and that's growth. And it's not just intellectual, but it's real. You change yourself at the being level. Then the next time you start there. And when you start there, it all comes back generally pretty quickly, much faster than it did the first time. The first time takes close to forever. The next time is a lot shorter than that, and eventually, you know, you're even way up past that. And it's simple, it comes back quickly. You know, sometimes you hear uh, the metaphor that, oh, so and so is an old soul. That's usually because they act more grown up than one would expect, you know. They're uh, more interested in other people. They're less self-centered. They're more caring. They're more compassionate. And maybe they're only you know, six years old when they're generally self-centered and very grabby. Well, people will say that's an old soul. Well, that's true. That's somebody that's probably been around enough times that they already come in with a lot of that knowledge about what's important and what's not. So yeah, you get it a lot quicker. Yay. And quicker and quicker as time goes on because you start where you left off. That's the point. And if you de-evolve, it's the same thing. So if here's where you start, you gain here. Next time you start, here. If you de-evolve to there, next time you start, down there. So it works either way. If you de-evolve, you start in a hole. Now you're going to have to work just to get back to where you were before you did evolved. Yeah. So that's the punishment <laughs> for poor choices, is that you have to do it again. And you end up doing it from a position of, that's less favorable, because you've de evolved some to begin with. The next thing I wanted to ask you was about, you were referring to the different reality frames that we have that each one is a place to make choices where we're, we're, we're working on our job growing up. Our, this reality, we're working on that, our dream reality, and then if, we're, if we can visit any other reality, of course, we get to make choices and do that. So what I was wondering, wouldn't it still be possible for us to de-evolve by making the wrong choices in video games? Sure. Any choice you make. Any choice you make. So then the folks that are, are playing the games where they're having fun killing people are probably doing themselves a, a terrible disservice. It depends on, again, the intent. It's not what you do, it's the intent you do it with. So let's say somebody's playing one of those video games where you, you know, run over people and kill people and you're a monster, okay? And if they do that with the idea that there's this game and here are the rules and here's what you're supposed to do and you're supposed to get points. Da, 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 da. Yeah, ran over that one, ran over that one, bang, 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 got you. All right, I got a bunch of points. Good game. It's not, they're not going to de-evolve for that. 
they're not making choices to, you know, to hurt and to damage it. They're just playing a game. Okay. But if you've got somebody else playing that same game that's playing it, and every time they get a chance to run over somebody, they go, good, got that sucker. You know, good, got that one too. Makes me feel better when I run over people. Now, they may be de-evolving as they play the game. So it's the intention. If it's just a game and this is how you win the game, so they're going to do what they do to win the game, uh, not a problem. That's not going to be de-evolving. Not just because of what you do. It's why you do it. It's the intent with which you do it. If there's malice in that intent, that's a wrong choice. If there's no malice in that intent, it's a benign choice. So it's not the game that's the issue. It's the quality of the individual playing that game that's an issue. But that game may set up a situation where making poor choices is easy. You don't actually have to go out and run over somebody with, with a malevolent intent. You can run over somebody in a game with a malevolent intent, so now it's just made exercising your, your nastiness easier. So in that sense, it can be a problem. VR. Yeah, but as we, you know, as we get more choices, and the video games give us more choices. There's another whole space within which we can interact. You know, as we get all these extra choices, these choices always allow us to evolve or de-evolve. You never get a situation where, oh, join this game because you only make good choices here. You know, you can only evolve in this game. It's not like that. Anytime you have a choice, you always have, you know, if you get the, the do-it choice, you've always got the don't do-it choice. So, video games just give us another set of choices, another space in which to grow up or grow down, or it's neutral. It doesn't matter. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, Ted wrote a, an extension to MBT specifically talking about uh, Dr. Kersey's uh, personalities, uh, the different, how uh, seven billion of us fit into 16 basic personalities. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I don't know much about it. Ted sent all that to me, too. Ted, by the way, those of you who don't know who Ted is, he was the administrator at the MBT Forum for a long time. He died about a year or so ago. Anyway, uh, Ted sent that to me. I didn't have a lot of time for it, but he sent me a, a little description that went with me. You know, I am in the, it was, it's built, it's a, it's a, a superset of Myers-Briggs. You kind of start with Myers-Briggs and then you expand it and you explore the, the positions between the 16 possibilities. Myers-Briggs is a four by four matrix. You get 16 possibilities. And this explores a little finer grain of the space between those and adds some things to it. And what Ted said that I was, you know, because I'm a, INTP. So he took that and read all the thing, and I was an architect and this and that. I have to tell you that it hit pretty much right on the nose. It was very accurate. So I only have a data point of one. You know that doesn't make a trend, but it nailed me very well. I thought, and I, him. I thought it nailed me as well. I was identified as an INFP, an idealist healer. And uh, he cautioned me about trying too hard to explore uh, non-physical material reality because people with that uh, proclivity tend to get overwhelmed. And something about that rang home with me. So I, I kind of backed off on, okay, I'm going to try so hard, try so hard, and I'm just going to let it happen when it happens because then I'll be ready for it. So I didn't follow what he said a whole lot. I was really busy, but it seemed to have some merit to it. <laughs>